Cool. Uh, let's get started. So hi, I'm Dave. Uh, I'm going to be talking about wiring Prismatics API with Funhouse and Coax. So Funhouse is a library that allows us to define an API in terms of handlers that look like this. This is a Funhouse handler. It's safe, readable, and has no global variables. Plus, it allows to us to do much, much more. So this is the overview of the talk. We're going to start with closure functions, annotate them with Prismatic's open source libraries, plumbing, and schema. And then we're going to pull off those annotations using Funhouse. Funhouse is a library that allows us to read in annotated functions and summarize the information in those functions into an annotation info, uh, a handler info. And then what's really exciting is how we can apply those handler infos to do a whole host of different applications. So we're going to be talking about an application that generates documentation of your API, an application that uh, allows you to actually spin up a web service using these annotated handlers. And in order to do that, we have this small routing library that routes requests to the appropriate handler. The next two applications are uh, ring middleware, a special schema coercion ring middleware that coerces requests into the appropriate form and responses into an appropriate form. And the last application that I'll talk about is Coax, which is a library that can read the uh, handler info and generate client code. So let's get started with an example, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. So this is my website. A user comes to my website and fills out this form. The user types in their name and pushes submit. And that gets sent off up to the server. On the server, Ring intercepts this request and converts it into a map that looks like this, where there are keywords as keys in the map. And then there can be nested maps within it that also have keyword keys. So in this particular case, um, the map has a body key. And then under the body, there's another map with a user key. And the user uh, maps to a value, which is the name of our user. Um, next, this request gets passed up to a handler. And a handler really is just a function from request to response. So the handler takes this request as input and generates a response as output. The response is also another one of these maps with keyword keys. Um, and it gets sent back down to the client. So let's take a look at how we can implement this handler using Clojure. So as I said, a handler is simply a function from request to response. This handler takes in the request, pulls out the user from the map, the nested map that's in the body and then the user, binds it to this user variable, and asserts that it's present. And then if it is present, uh, we return uh, another map uh, with a body that says hello to the user. So this handler is doing something very simple. But there's still a lot of boilerplate code that goes around it. Um, so we have this let binding, and we have the assert. And you know, even though this is a simple example, you can imagine that as you're pulling more and more things out of the request, uh, uh, this boilerplate grows and grows. So wouldn't it be great if there was a library that uh, addressed the boilerplate for us? Well, there is. It's plumbing. Plumbing is a library that uh, Prismatic released a while ago. Who here has seen Plumbing or used it? OK, great, quite a lot. Um, plumbing is a library that introduces a macro called the keyword function. And what that keyword function does is it allows you to safely destructure your input. Um, and it's optimized for processing inputs of maps with keywords as keys. So let's take a look at how we can use it to improve on our simple handler. So here's the handler from before at the top. And at the bottom is the keyword macro version of the handler. So uh, they do the same thing, but the amount of code for the keyword function is a lot smaller. What it does 
is in the argument list, it safely destructures the input map, um, looks inside the body, and then within the body under the user key, and saves the value there under the user variable. Then it can use the variable inside the body of the function just as before. Um, so that's what keyword functions allow us to do, safely destructure the inputs. Um, they also allow us to validate the inputs. So here's our keyword handler, our keyword function handler. Uh, when we call it with valid input, uh, like we saw in the previous slide, we get a response that says, hello, John, just as we would expect. But it also validates the input. So if we call it with a malformed uh, input, so here I'm calling it with a string as opposed to a map, uh, we get a runtime exception that tells us as much. Um, you, your function was called on a non-map. And if we call it with a map, but now where the map is in the wrong format, so here I have a bad key instead of the user key, uh, we get an error message that's informative and tells us as much. It says, the key user was not found in the map. Um, the only keys in the map were bad. Um, so keyword functions allow us to safely destructure our inputs. They're also nice because they provide a nice syntax for doing default arguments. So here I'm defaulting the user argument to be the string user so that if I call it uh, on, a, on a map that has a user field, we use that. But if the user field is absent, then I default the value of the user uh, to be the string u. So keyword functions are great, safely destructure the input, and also provide a nice syntax for default values. Let's see how we can use keyword functions to build a more complicated example of a handler. So here's a slightly more complicated example. It's a guest book application. So users come in, they fill out information about themselves, like their name, their age, and their favorite language, be it closure or closure script. Uh, they submit that form, and it gets sent up to the server, presumably so that later on user, other users can come by and see all of the people who have signed the guestbook. So this is just a standard guestbook example. So let's see what the handler for this guestbook might look like. So we're going to start uh, with this global map, uh, a global uh, def of the guestbook, which is just a seek of entries. Um, represented as an atom wrapping a vector. Uh, we're going to address the global property in a second, but for now, uh, the entries in the, in the guestbook are going to be globals. Then uh, the sign guestbook handler is pretty straightforward. We pull out the body from the request and then simply conjure to the end of the guestbook. Right? Seems pretty, pretty natural. But there's a problem. So what guarantees that our clients are going to be sending us the right data, data in the right format? Right? So we know what we want. We want maps with a name, an age, and a language, favorite language. Um, but there's nothing that guarantees that, that the users are going to send up the right uh, form. And Prismatic has a library to address that problem. Uh, it's called Schema. Who here has used Schema? OK, quite a lot of people. Great. Um, so Schema is a library that allows you to describe the shape of data. Um, and it also allows you to validate that data that you get matches the expected shape. So let's take a look at an example. So we want to get data that looks kind of like this, a map with a name, an age, and a favorite language. Right? So this is one particular example. We want to generally accept things that look like this, a map with a required key name that's a string, a required key age that's a long, and a required key lang, which is one of either closure or closure script. So we can, uh, so this schema allows us to declare what shape we want the data to look like. Moreover, we can annotate our keyword functions using schema. So here I'm saying that the body that I pull out of the request should match this entry schema. So now we can safely assert that that's what we want the body to look like. 
and we're declaring the, what form the input should be. So we can inspect uh, the inputs to this function using this uh, function in uh, plumbing. And so we say, what are the inputs to sign guestbook? Well, it's expecting a map. The map should have keywords as keys that map to values. One of the required keys in the map is body. And the value for body should match this entry schema that has a name, an age, and a favorite language. We can also use schema for validation. So if we call our handler using a valid map, everything is good. But if we call it with a malformed map, we get an exception that describes what the problem is with the data. So here I'm calling it with a map. I've left off the favorite language keyword, and the error message tells me that there's a missing required key, lang. Um, and the value that I passed in for the age is a string. Uh, and so it's telling me that the string is not an instance of a long. So it's telling me that the input that I gave it doesn't match the schema. And the error message is actually very informative. It tells us that uh, which parts of the data are incorrect. So schema is great because it allows us to declare what types of inputs our function takes. Now let me just make a small note about global resources. Um, so before I said that our guest book was going to be represented as this global uh, sequence of the different entries that have been entered into the guest book, um, and that's no good. So why is it no good? Global resources aren't very good because it couples together different functions uh, that rely on that global resource. So that if you wanted to test the two functions in parallel, for example, you would, have, you would be uh, kind of stuck because you would have to mock out what the global resources look like for each of those two functions. But if it's global, then you can't really do that. So what we do is we introduce another layer in the input to the handler. So now the handler is going to take a map with two top-level keys. One of them will be the request, just as before. And then the other one is going to be uh, the resources that the handler depends on. And there's not too much overhead in terms of code when you introduce this extra layer at the top of the map because you're using keyword functions. So you can just safely destructure it uh, right in the argument vector. So I've kind of laid the groundwork for what Funhouse is. Um, and so now let me talk about uh, the details of Funhouse. So as I said in the beginning of the talk, Funhouse is a small library that can look at handlers annotated with schemas and pull off lots of information about those handlers and summarize all of that information into a handler info. So we have our handler and the info about the handler, and we can use those things for a whole host of different applications. So let's take a look at an example in more detail. Here is a Funhouse handler, and it looks very similar to the functions that I was talking about on the previous slide. There's a few small differences. Uh, one of them is that this keyword function has a doc string, and doc string, or keyword functions can accept doc strings, and they behave just like they would on a regular closure function. Um, there's also this responses metadata that we put on the handler. This responses metadata is a map from status code, so in this case 200, to the schema that the body of the response should match. So this handler the bot is going to return a map with the body, uh, and the body is going to be a seek of entries. Um, so let's go into, let's see all of the different pieces of information that are contained in this handler. So from the name, we can pull off information about the path and the method, where the method is just the last uh, word after the dollar sign in the name. You can extract information about, uh, the, from the doc string about what the description of the handler is. You can get information about the schema of the responses, so for the status code, what the body schema should be. You can get 
uh, information about what the handler expects from the request. So this handler uh, takes in a request that has a body, and the body is an entry. But in general, requests can have a lot more to them. So they can have query parameters or URI arguments, and you can specify what the schema is for those two. You also know information about the resources that this handler depends on. So this handler depends on a guest book, um, which we haven't schematized, so it defaults to the any schema. And last, we can pull off information about the source map, so where this handler was defined in source code, what line number, what file, what namespace. Um, and so in total, we have our handler and a summary of uh, various pieces of information about our handler. Uh, and so together, we call this an annotated handler. Um, and so that's kind of what Funhouse does. It's very simple. It just pulls off information from our handler to get this summary and returns these annotated handlers. The really interesting thing is how these annotated handlers can be turned into applications. So the first of the applications that I'll be talking about is documentation. So we have all of this information from our handlers. We can just throw that up on the web so that users of our uh, handlers, of our API, can read about what the expected inputs are, what the expected outputs are, and so forth. Right? This is just all of the same information that we extract from the handler in HTML format. We can also, since we've pulled off the source map information, we have these links at the top. You can click through, the, and it will take you to the source code for the, uh, for the handler. Right? You can, if you're curious, you can see how it's actually implemented. Um, but uh, this uh, doc isn't very beautiful. right? Um, it's just the one that we ship with Funhouse, just as a proof of concept. There's been work on integrating Funhouse with other libraries, like Swagger. So Tommy Riemann uh, has worked on integrating uh, Funhouse. Even though it's such a new library, he's worked on integrating it with Swagger. And that provides a much nicer description of what the API is. So you can see that uh, the various inputs and outputs. A nice thing about Swagger is that it provides a client to the API right in the documentation. Um, and so you can post values up to the different handlers and take a look at the responses that they'll return. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and that's a general pattern for all of these libraries that I'm talking about. They're all very small and uh, can be easily swapped out if you have a more preferred library. So keep that in mind as I'm going through the rest of them. So the next uh, library that I want to talk about is a simple routing library that ships with Funhouse. So it's easy to turn a namespace of handlers into a full API. All you have to do is take your resources, pass them into this namespace to handlers fun, where you specify prefixes that you want to serve your handlers on, and the namespace containing all of the handler functions. This function goes into the namespace and loads up all of the handlers from that namespace. Um, a handler is just one that has metadata that has responses on it. So that's how we decide for a namespace what's a handler, what's not. Um, and then you just call start API. And there's some routing that goes on, which uh, takes all of your different handlers and builds this mega handler out of them so that when a request comes in, uh, this mega handler routes it to the appropriate uh, smaller handler um, based on the URI of the request. So this is just a very simple routing library that's necessary for spinning up a web server. So the standard thing you would want to do with Funhouse handlers is make a web server. And so we're shipping a small library that allows you to do that. OK, the next two applications are really the interesting ones. And so this is where you should pay attention. Um, so uh, this next uh, library that I'm going to be talking about is a special ring middleware that coerces inputs uh, to be an appropriate form and outputs uh, into an appropriate form. Let, let me show you what I mean. 
So let's turn back to our simple guestbook example. Users come in. They fill out this form and send up their name, age, and favorite language. So typically, at least in the applications that we're working with, this data is sent up as JSON. And then that gets passed into Ring. And Ring converts the JSON into a closure map where it has keywords as keys, but the values are all strings, right? So when we try calling our handler on this input, we're going to have a schema check exception. We're going to see that the age isn't a long as expected, and the favorite language isn't a keyword, right? So to summarize, what we're getting is a map with strings as the values, but what we want is a map which has uh, a long as the age and a keyword as the favorite language. So what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is we can take off the schema annotation on the body in the request for our handler and introduce all of this extra conversion code into our handler, right? So we take our body, we parse the age into a long, then we convert the favorite language into a keyword, and uh, that's actually really messy, right? We don't want to do that. Um, so wouldn't it be great if uh, the middleware just did this for us? Well, what we get is a map with strings as values, and what we want is a map with a long and a keyword, right? Um, and we've already specified this in the schema. We've said that uh, for the age, it should be a long. And for the language, it should be a keyword, right? So can't we just use this schema that we have already put on the body of our request to automatically convert the data into the proper format? Well, we can with a special middleware. So uh, middleware is just a layer that wraps your handler that intercepts the request before it hits the handler, right? So you can do some processing on the request before your handler actually sees it. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So here's our example again. Users submit their information. Uh, it gets sent up. Ring converts it into a map. The values are strings. But now there's the special coercion middleware that happens in between uh, or happens next. And so the coercion middleware has access to the schema on the handler. And so it can coerce the data into the proper format. So it knows by default how to convert longs, uh, strings into longs and keywords, or strings into keywords. Um, so now we have our data in the appropriate format, and we can pass it to our handler, and everything will work as expected. Right? Another cool feature of the special coercion middleware is that you can also do output coercion. So not only does the handler intercept the request, sorry, not only does the middleware intercept the request before it hits the handler, but it can also intercept the response before it hits the client, right? So here's a scenario. Suppose your boss comes to you and he says, you know how you've been using entries throughout your guestbook application? We want to convert to client entries, which are just like entries, but they have the name split up into two fields, a first name and a last name. Right? Think about all of the work that you might have to do uh, in order to convert all of the places for all, your whole application. Everywhere that you return a client, uh, an entry to the client, you now have to convert it into uh, this format. So um, that's not so great. So what we can do is we can uh, use this coercion middleware to do output coercion. Here I'm showing an output coercer. Uh, it's just a function that uh, matches against schemas. So it says, what is the response schema that you want to match? Right? If it's a client entry, then take your data, pull off the name, split it into a first name and a last name, and then dissociate the name from the uh, entry 
and associate the first name and the last name to the map. Right? So now, when our handler is going to return a response to the user, um, it just returns an entry just as before. You don't have to change any of your code. Right? But you can plug in this special coercion middleware, uh, special schema coercer into your coercion middleware, and it will automatically uh, convert entries into client entries using that code that I showed on the previous slide. And then now that you have client entries, you can send them back down to the client. Cool. So uh, the last of the applications that I want to talk about is coax. Um, and coax uh, addresses a problem that we had in practice. So uh, like all of these other libraries, by the way. Um, so uh, at Prismatic, we have this web service that's implemented in Clojure on the back end. And we have many different front end uh, clients. So we have iPhones and iPads that are uh, built using Objective-C. We have web clients that are built in ClojureScript. And then we also have Android clients, or we're starting to at least, um, that are built in Java. Right? And so anytime we make a change on the back end to any of the APIs, right, let's say we change what the definition of one of the entry schemas looks like. Right? Any client that sends up an entry or receives an entry has to now update its code base. So for one change on the back end, we now have to change what uh, three different code bases to reflect that change. And so coax addresses that problem. Coax is a library that reads these funhouse annotations, and in particular the schemas, and it can convert a closure schema into client code. So it actually generates the client code um, for the different model files that are sent up and are received from the server. So here's our entry schema. Coax will read this schema and actually output the Objective-C code. So um, the, there's a lot more Objective-C code that you need for a particular uh, schema, um, because Clojure is just a shorter language. But uh, so it outputs this kind of uh, simple model object that just holds the data um, and provides ways to access it, like getters and setters. Um, it also generates the, the dot, uh, .m file, so like the actual, not just the dot .h, but you know, the whole, the whole Objective-C thing, um, and provides nice uh, serialization libraries. So you can convert to a dictionary and from a dictionary, um, and it, uh, it converts it to a JSON uh, data structure that's ready to be sent across the wire. So um, there's this thing called schema extensions where you can express hierarchical relationships between, your, uh, between different schemas. So here in my example, I have this book, which is an abstract kind of schema that can be realized in terms of a novel or a comic. Um, and so there's these, the, this uh, inherent class hierarchy that coax can respect when it generates the client code. So if, for example, you wanted to convert this into Java, you can say, oh, I have a class for the novel, and it extends the class for the book. So coax respects these class hierarchies that are defined using schema extensions. Um, and the last thing I want to mention about coax is that it's customizable. So there's this process where it reads the schema, and then it converts it into an intermediate format, and then from that intermediate format generates the client code. But there's a place to plug in your own emission code. So if you want to do different things, for example, based on the name of the schema, you can plug something in there uh, and then just generate a different thing if your schema ends with you know, some particular suffix. So that's what coax is. It reads schemas, uh, then can generate client code. Um, and it's customizable, and it respects class hierarchies that are defined using schema extensions. So yeah, so let's keep, recap what we talked about. So we started with closure functions. 
that were annotated using plumbing and schema. We read those annotations using Funhouse, this new library, um, to get an annotated handler. And then we saw how to apply those annotations to different applications, so generating documents, spinning up a web server that does routing, uh, doing special uh, uh, coercion middleware that is aware of your schemas on the inputs and the outputs and can intelligently convert data into the proper form. Uh, and Coax, which is a nice library that can read your schemas and generate client code so that your clients are always in sync with uh, the current state of your API. So um, if you want to check it out, it's now released. It's open sourced, so you can see Funhouse on GitHub. Uh, if you want to stay up to date on future uh, releases, you can follow us on Twitter at Prismatic Eng. Uh, and yesterday we had a party at our place, and it was uh, a lot of fun. And so if you want to get updates about future events, you can email us at events at getprismatic.com, and we'll add you to the mailing list so you can stay up to date with what, what events there are. Thank you. So I have a lot of time to answer questions, and yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, there's a lot of different approaches that you can take. Uh, I think in-house what we're doing is we just have a separate namespace for different versions of the API. And if some things kind of stay the same from version to version, we just kind of copy them over so that we can safely delete the, the old version once we uh, stop supporting it. Yeah. Yeah, so, oh, sorry, I should be repeating the question. So uh, the first question was about versioning. Uh, this next question is about coercions and schemas. So um, schema uh, had a recent update to the schema library that supports coercion. Um, and so that defined kind of how you can match against a target schema and translate data into that form. So that's, that, that is an older release, like uh, a few months ago, I guess, we, we released an update to that. Um, what I'm showing here is how that plugs in with Funhouse, right? And so how you can um, take these uh, annotations on the handlers and apply the schema coercion to build a special ring middleware that, that does the coercion. Yeah. Yes? Uh, so the question was whether we use coax with core data. Um, so uh, w which part of core data specifically do you? Uh, the same API that you have to do the data. The data objects, I see. Um, I'm not sure, actually. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't think that we do, but I could be wrong. <laughs> Yeah, so coax is, is going to be released uh, pretty soon, and so I guess you can take a look at the source to see. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? So the question was, what do we do for authentication? And it's a great question. Um, so uh, we do have special stuff for authentication, which I didn't talk about here. Um, we, we have a middleware that basically saves uh, sessions for different users. Um, and then you might want different behavior for different handlers. For instance, some of the handlers might be, um, you know, you have to be uh, logged in or you have to be an admin user or something like that. And uh, I didn't mention it in my talk, but actually you can annotate your functions with uh, however you want. Um, and there's a place to plug in a function that extracts those annotations um, when you're parsing the namespaces to convert them to handlers. So what we do is we put like a little metadata on the functions that says the auth level. Um, and then you can, uh, using a special middleware, you can check that the request coming in is of the right 
authentication level and then uh, either you know allow the request to go through or not. But it's very easy to like plug in your own kind of use case into this uh, annotation uh, annotations that you can put onto your handlers. So it's very ex easy to extend. Yes. Doesn't play well with Liberator. So I'm not sure about Liberator in particular, but um, uh, I, yeah, so, sorry, the question was, does this play well with Liberator? Um, and so I should say that there's a lot of different routing libraries out there, right? Um, and the routing module here is uh, swappable. So we're just shipping with one that, uh, to demonstrate how you can convert these uh, annotated handlers into a full web service. It happens to be the one that we use internally. It's fast. It supports various features like URI argument extraction um, uh, and wildcards also. Uh, but yeah, if you want to, ha if you have your own favorite library, you can swap that out and still use Funhouse to get all of the other benefits that it provides. Any other questions? Great, thanks.